Hello, and welcome back to the AI Insiders podcast, the flagship podcast of some humans and AI and some combination thereof, because it's getting weird that way. And what better person to help us all navigate this weird than your host, Adam Russell. I'm director of the AI division at USC's ISI, Information Sciences Institute, and I'm a sociocultural anthropologist. So weird is kind of my brand at this point. But I'll tell you who could be better. It's the humans behind AI at ISI. And as director, I'm on a quest to get to know more about these humans, not just what they do technically, but who they are and why they do it and what they think and hope for and fear and scratch their heads about with this whole AI thing. So my hypothesis, as we start another podcast here, again, is to remind you that I think talking to the humans behind AI will give us a better sense of AI itself. Since even the most powerful systems now remain, at least to some degree, mirrors of our own selves, the way we create them, but also how we use them and the questions we ask. So it's not just how AI is built and trained, but how it's increasingly integrated into all of our lives, often in ways that are far from obvious. So this theme of trying to understand the non-obvious is actually where I'll start today with my guest, Abigail Horn, who does some very interesting work using AI to tackle what, what may seem like obvious problems, but which may have non-obvious causes and therefore require non-obvious solutions. But I'll let her clarify that as we move on. So this is AI Insiders. I'll let her explain that what, what she does. And of course, uh, being AI Insiders, we're going to start with that odd question. Abigail, if you don't mind, I'm going to take you back in time. And I'm going to watch you explain to your 10 year old self, what do you do? Um, okay. You gave me a curveball there with my 10 year old self, not my six year old self, <laughs> um, which I like because it's a little different. And um, where is your 10 year old self? First of all, my 10 year old self was in living in Brasilia, Brazil. Um, and was extremely serious and wanted to be a fantasy writer. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll try to appeal to that aspect. Um, I develop mathematical formulations using computers, which you can only imagine what they're going to be capable of doing in mm -hmm. some years in the future. We don't have to say exactly how many. <laughs> and um, the what I really like doing is solving problems that can really help people be healthier and happier and have more inspiration and capacity for creative thought in their lives. I, I'm tempted to go down the avenue of saying um, people tend to think that, you know, some math and physics aren't particularly creative uh, disciplines. I have since come to realize how wrong that is, right? Because it, Solve, problem solving is inherently sort of creative. Um, but but my understanding of of the approach you're taking is you don't do AI just for the sake of AI. That AI is not sort of why it's a, it's a how. And AI you see as a way of trying to solve some of those problems. So tell me a little bit, or even your 10-year-old self, how do you bump into AI at what point? And you realize, huh, this can help me solve the problems that I think are really important. Absolutely. I am... Um especially in comparison with my peers here in the AI division, an extremely applied researcher. So mm -hmm. I'm extremely motivated by the big problems that I want to solve in nutrition and food systems mm -hmm. and chronic diseases. And that's what really keeps me going. That's what I'm kind of thinking about all the time. And I'll use whatever tools are necessary to get there. And I didn't actually have this vision of I'm going to be integrating all this AI into my research to do that, but there's so many tools here to use. And then since I joined ISI, there's people with so many ideas about how we can do that and work together on that. And so that the AI was in my research in the broader sense before I joined ISI with network science and computational social science. But it wasn't until I joined that I really started these projects that are very clearly like AI and nutrition science and 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 public health. So, so I think sometimes people don't realize the degree to which AI generally, but also AI for solving applied problems, is a team sport. Let's touch on that a little bit. Uh, and with every team, 
um, what makes them really special is the people that come to those teams and what they bring to the table. I oftentimes refer to that as their, their secret power mm. um, or their secret superpower. What would you say is your, your superpower? Um, <laughs> yeah, I like that. So I've done my training in physics and engineering and public health, and now I'm at ISI. And so what I um, have to embrace as my superpower is being able to straddle those fields and be translate between the two. And, you know, sometimes it's hard because you can't be the best on either side, but you can be the best at being in between. Um, not that I'm the best, but, <laughs> or anything no, close that to is, that. That is your superpower. That's right. Exactly. And, and, and just uh, embracing that's what I, I can really contribute to these teams. And it's hard because, I mean, maybe, you know, being extremely uh, in, interdisciplinary, but you, there's always so much you feel like you don't know. Although I think everyone feels like that, even if they're the top, top, top of their field. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I it's interesting. This, uh, this in between this as a superpower, uh, I think is really, what else say? It's powerful. Um, and we, and we need more of that to be honest, but, uh, what advice given where you are, given the complexities and challenges you've, you faced being this interdisciplinary person, what advice would you give to someone, a younger person who's interested in either getting into AI or using AI to solve, solve hard problems? My advice, and I was given this advice too, and I so value it is follow what motivates you and what you think is important and educate yourself on what, what that is and what, you know, if you think it's important, read more about that, engage in that topic. You, if you care about that problem, you will learn what's necessary along the way or come up with two approaches to approaching that, that are going to help you get where you want to be and, you know, get you out of bed in the morning and drive you forward. Like it. Find, find the, the problem that drives you. Yeah. A lot of wisdom and that idea of starting with a good problem and how, how that drives people. Um, one problem that I think has raised itself in, in terms of popular consciousness, right. Mm -hmm. With, with the large language models is this fear of fear, uh, maybe in some cases, hype of AI, what do your friends and family think about what you're doing and how do, how do they, um, do they understand what you're doing? And, and even if they don't like how, you know, what, what are their comments about you being in this, this weird space of AI right now? So the people I currently spend most time with in my family are my five month old baby. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much. My husband and my parents, who and and my mother in law who are supporting our, us with this uh, takes amazing village baby yep yep and they couldn't be more excited and supported I mean all of the, the grandparents are so invested in the latest developments in AI and cool. actually integrating what they can to their research so even when I was preparing for having this baby my my mom was using. Uh, chat GPT, I guess, whatever it was back then, 3.5 to come up with lists of all, all the stuff I needed for bringing baby home. And just, you know, just one example, but they are also more invested in like the research and the research directions. And they're, they're not worried about where things go because I think I come from a, a hopeful family. Mm -hmm. I have this perspective and I think a lot of it comes from the discussions I have with my my parents and my husband around we have a lot of trust in the innate desire of humanity to work together to to solve these big problems and and those are the people who live in the world currently and want to support that happening and those are the people who are going to be continuing to develop AI. So at least in the future that we can envision I would say the general feeling is excitement and they love that I'm in this and invested in this and they can learn even more directly about what's the latest in the fields. You mentioned, again, congratulations on your on your five-month-old. Uh, aside from just not being able to sleep, 
has having uh, a baby shaped how you think about AI at all? Yes, totally. And so it's the kind of thing where it's shaped, reshaped so much in how I think about anything and everything. Um, and then as I think something that just keeps on coming up, the importance of embracing randomness in life hmm. and the randomness is so important and the randomness is so important to those cognitive processes. And I'm, uh, you know, I can think about that in terms of how I see my baby learning and yeah. she'll learn something. She'll see something happen in different ways and she'll be able to integrate those as being a pattern. And that's something that even like the most sophisticated models that, um, that I've worked on, you introduce a new data set and the whole thing, it has to relearn everything and it has to be retrained. And so that's a, that's a huge Achilles heel of AI development is that ability to, I guess, embrace randomness or, or deal with randomness. So I think that it's helping me to like, really like bring me out of my stupid, predictable day-to-day -day patterns and really think more broadly and, and more randomly. I, I have a six and a three-year-old and when they were uh, infants, we, we, we called them the error variable because every formula <laughs> has an error and like we could come up with our plans, and, but you got to factor in that error variable. But to your point, like it's not, it's not always noise. It's the source of you know, signal. It's a source of novelty and innovation. And I, yeah, I agree. Um, it also is this interesting question of um, this notion that we're going to code in morality or ethics to AI. And yet the way we, we ourselves come to, to understand these things is through this exploration of the world, right? It's through right. interaction and yeah, engagement. Um, let's say uh, AI systems, um, whether they're partners or or considered partners or you know lab assistants or something, begin to become truly intelligent as we understand mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. you know, goal directed reasoning behavior uh, and have developed some capability for empathy, uh, but they actually just don't understand humans. Um, and you have the opportunity now to give them a book or a movie or some cultural artifact they can consume and possibly get a better understanding of of what they're dealing with with humans. What book, what movie, what what artifact would you pick? I know immediately my answer, and it's the I mean, without without even thinking about it, is it's the Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov written over many years and redrafted and redrafted also as different uh, leadership came into power and things had to be hidden. And I should have, I don't know, I don't remember exactly when it was published, but it was close to his death. Something that I, I, I just remember is more safe for this to be released, but it is um, Russian realism, magical realism. There's a ton of surreal surrealism. It's essentially the devil comes to um, St. Petersburg and gives these options to different people. There's not like a, a clear objective that the devil has, but the devil is a likable character. And we actually end up kind of rooting for the devil through how the devil is interacting with people. And the devil is very playful and sometimes very twisted, but not always. And we relate to the devil and so i think having that concept and it, there's there's all these games being played and then there are these there's a story about the master who's writing this novel and margarita his love interest and these these there's still a very real uh human plot mm -hmm. unfolding but but it's all very fun and playful and i think so so many of those elements are very human and not necessary for you know, it, it was it wouldn't be a solution that we'd come to with engineering alone. Mm. Well, I don't know if we we might link uh, to that reference in the, in the show notes because I, I I'm going to check that out. That sounds phenomenal. I, I love you know Gabriel Garcia Marquez and what like magical realism can reveal about us. Yeah, no, it's a, that's a good answer. All right, well, we'll get that one teed up for for AI. Nice. Um, let's talk about your relationship with AI. And mm. guess what? It's gone brilliantly. Uh, it has answered all your wildest dreams. You've you have like mastered this this black magic. You are now able to conjure up uh, the solutions to the problem you're going after. What does the world look like? Because you were successful. What does the world look like now? Um. Well, that's fun to think about. The there is not just access, but use integration of healthy 
lifestyle patterns in um people's life across the board that's a it's a given that that we don't think about it that we don't think mm. about our long-term health that we don't think about preventative health and that's not built into society now so it, it is built and it's back nature you know yeah. and um so that means we eat healthy and we exercise in a healthy measured way and there are some cultures that model this really well and hmm. there are some that that don't and it's the root of the major burden of disease mm -hmm. disability death in i mean the the overwhelming majority of the world and definitely the u.s with this yeah. these leading to chronic diseases so that's a very extremely lofty vision um but that's where it is possible <laughs> well we started by by talking about the non-obvious and i think this is this touches on that which is you people may conceptually understand why do you eat better or or people need to eat better right because we right. know it contributes to these chronic diseases but in sort of a, almost a pathological sense of individualism it's like why don't they just eat better and and from my understanding of some of the work you do is you point out that it's really to, to quote a book i i once uh, enjoyed i think you'll find it's more complicated than that uh, partly because you know humans are a product and part of of the environments, and those environments are really hard for for us to understand to some degree, but also, yeah, yeah intervene. So that's I guess that's what I mean by the non obvious. And to get where you want to get, it cannot just be the burden on the individual because we are, you know, subject to these other forces that that you can sort of pick up on now, right? That is, you know, we've been telling people what to eat. Yes, we're optimizing. Uh, personalized nutrition and all of the different factors that we can really cater to individuals but telling people what to eat it doesn't work because most people can't access that for any number yeah. of reasons and that could be a physical access it could be temporal access it could be cultural barriers and um social context and there's so many factors that play into that it's a huge systems problem and mm. so it needs to be addressed as a systems problem and not just focus on the individual level. Yeah. And hu humans are just, you know, historically really bad at that kind of thinking. So I, you know, we're going to need AI in this space, as you know, already, as I'm warning. Um, yeah. And that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see it come, come to bear, uh, especially coming even from social science, right? I, I'm excited about what AI means for social science. Totally. Even as we're going to need social science to sort of survive AI. All right. Well, I, I could go on forever, uh, as anyone who's been on this podcast knows, but I'm not going to do that to you because you you have a future to help materialize. Uh, and I want to be in that future. Uh, it gives us, okay, dad joke coming, right? It gives us food for thought. <laughs> Cue thy rolls, uh, which are in your future with your kids too. Um, try that AI. But um, yeah, really, I appreciate you coming on uh, and, and sharing uh, not just what you do, but again, why and a little bit more about you. This this is exactly what I was hoping to get out of these conversations. Um, the humans, the humans behind AI. Awesome! Thank you so much, and thanks, thank you for doing this, and keep on doing it because I want to keep on learning about my peers, and I can do it through talking with them too. And um, I think it it inspires it inspires me to want to do to realize I really need to do more of that. That means a lot to me. Thanks, Abigail. Um, I'm looking forward to doing more of those podcasts uh, where we get to meet, uh, again, your colleagues, Abigail, mine, um, where we are, uh, you know, our mission here is to bring uh, USC's deep technical competence, uh, our ISI character, now increasingly our ability to connect with each other and with others out there, maybe someone listening to the podcast, uh, to make the most contribution we can to help, help us realize a world where AI empowers all of us to realize the very best we can become. And then- uh, I hope helps us all of us become that uh, because the world, uh, the fantastic world that I think we can make really depends on, on that. All right. Well, if you enjoy these short podcasts, please do the thing like us, give us stars, so many stars, spread the word, send us feedback. Uh, and we are starting to get some feedback, which is nice uh, or just keep listening and join us please again next time for another episode of AI insiders where we'll continue to navigate our way our collective way through this weird, weird world, uh, doing, I hope, what humans do best when they face these kinds of challenges, working together as if all of our lives depend on each other, because they do. So for now and for the future, fight on. Mm -hmm.